well, we're a little uh, tight on time, so I'm going to skip some of the preliminary baloney that you don't really want to hear anyway. Uh, as I was thinking before uh, Clore persuaded me to come down, I was thinking about trying to remember all this stuff. And I was reminded of something Mark Twain was reported to have said, that as he grew older, he remembered more and more things that never happened. <laughs> and I got a little worried that I might remember things that never happened. But uh, I've at least done one level of a review to make sure that most of what I tell you uh, happened. Uh, for me, the place it started was I had a meeting with uh, some people who seemed able to get things done in big companies. And, you know, the bureaucracy normally stifles any creativity at all. If it, if it finds any, it stamps it out immediately. And um, so I, the question that I asked that these folks, four or five, I think, two of whom were, one was Jim Clark, who truly is the father of the modular engine. Mm -hmm. That was his idea, and he personally pushed it. And the other was a, a lady named Janine Bay, who reported to me in a different job. And uh, this was in 92, I think. And uh, things were a lot different in those days. At, at Ford, anyway, there were all these crusty old guys who thought that, that a woman's place was uh, doing the laundry and cooking pancakes. And Janine was having none of that. She could get things done. And so uh, after one of these creativity meetings that I was having, I asked her to have a look at uh, building a, a Mustang that made more power and had better brakes and better tires. It was just generally a step up from what we had before. And I suggested that she uh, look at the Ford Racing Catalog, which was nothing like it is today, but nevertheless had parts, and, and most of them for uh, our V8 engines. And so she went off for a month or so, and really I kind of forgot about it, to tell you the truth. I had a lot of other stuff to do. Then she called me and asked me to come over to the test track, which was right across the street in, in Dearborn. And uh, here's this uh, Mustang which I think was red, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But in any event, it had uh, more attractive uh, wheels, better tires. And this is an area where my memory deviates a little bit from the written word. Uh, I am absolutely certain that when she showed that car to me, she said it was making 265 horsepower. And that was 40 more than, than the GT was supposed to be getting. Now, a subplot here is the GT wasn't really getting 225. In fact, it was getting 205. Somehow, muffler tunings, calibration changes, all this kind of stuff, the power had gone away. By the time, we were entertaining the fiction that it was getting 225, and so we thought this car she put together was making 40 more horsepower and had better brakes. And it was a great car. I drove it. It was obviously a better performer than anything we had at that time. And so I made the proposal, thank God we didn't do this, uh, that, it would, that we'd call it a GT40. You know, I'd never dreamt there'd be a Ford GT 10 years later that uh, would more appropriate. We thought we were going to call that GT40 also, but that's, that, that's a subject for a different meeting. Uh, in any event, uh, the question then was, what are we going to do with it? Well, the engineers can't organize selling cars you need to get in bed with the marketing and sales folks. And in fact, with the parts and service people. And there's a lot of people who need to be part of your scheme if you're going to sell a car. Uh, so I asked Janine to go over and have a word with the marketing and sales folks. And she did. And I, I was already on good terms with the vice president at the time, Bob Rui. And uh, Bob and I got together, and I just told him what I wanted to do. And we agreed that we would start, well, it wasn't, there was no plan in terms of a big organization. It was just Janine's little special vehicle engineering group, Rui and I talking, and we got a little confederation of people who were working as a team, but it was kind of a fictitious team. It wasn't an organization at all. Everybody was still working in their home organization. But uh, we decided that we would limit the volume, and the number we chose was 5,000. 
we wanted, we wanted the demand to exceed the supply all the time. If you have a car that sits on a dealer's lot and they can't sell it, it gets the scarlet letter immediately and you're dead. When that happens, you are dead and you can't bring it back to life. So we didn't want that. And we also agreed that we would have no advertising budget at all. We, we would have the uh, car magazines be our advertising. And in the event, we had so many magazine covers, it's incredible. Now, we didn't really have a name. I, I was still thinking GT40, but then I got called over to World Headquarters into a kind of intimidating office with the vice chairman and the head lawyer. And they said, we got a big problem. We are about to lose our claim on the name Cobra. And if we don't use it on something, we're going to lose the claim. Then we won't be able to say anything to Cobra anymore. So I said, well, of course they, were, they wanted me to solve that problem. <laughs> and I said, well, I've got this Mustang, Rui and I think we can sell. It's not a Cobra. You know, in my mind, a Cobra was the two-seat job that was racing in the 60s. Yeah. I have uh, an Autocraft Mark IV Cobra, so I mean, that's, that's a Cobra for me. But I said, if we have to, we'll call this Mustang a Cobra. So that's how the name Cobra came about. And uh, actually, it turned out only purists like me had any problem at all. I'd never heard anybody among a group like you saying we picked the wrong name. So I, I guess we were okay there. And so we started moving ahead to build 5,000 of these things. Now, once again, the only organization that existed at this point was the special vehicle engineering group that I had and this confederation of a small number of people from other organizations who were part of our team. John Plant was the guy from uh, sales and marketing. And Plant was, he's, I don't think he's here, but he was an enthusiast that was beyond measure fiction. And he played a big role in making us success of all this stuff. The, the name Special Vehicle Team hadn't surfaced at that point. And none of us thought it would be anything more than one car. And in fact, when you read the books that are written about this, it sounds like it was a well-organized, precision, you know, couldn't be further from the truth. It was just chaos all the time. Every day you'd make up a new rule. I mean, you know, every day brought new surprises. Problems here, problems there, this problem, whatever. Uh, and if you had told me then that SVT would still be alive in 20 years, I'd have said, you are completely crazy. That, that'll never happen. These things they last maybe a year, two, three years, and then it's over. Somebody else has a new idea. But anyway, we brought the, 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 the thing out. It's advertised at 235. I'm here to tell you that the, the, the original one got 265, and my guess is that anybody who has one of those early Cobras, it's, it makes more than 235. I don't know what the background was. I don't know what, there must have been some political reason for understating the power, but uh, it made more than that. And then the next year, I'm just going to tell you just a few vignettes and then open it up to questions, and I'll, I'll hurry through this. Uh, I talked to Coletti by that time. He was the third person heading the Special Vehicle Engineering Group. And I suggested to Coletti that uh, we build a convertible. And, and he and they said, oh, that's a, that's a terrible idea. That's, I mean, that's really a bad idea. So I said, well, why don't you guys go back and think about this a little bit? So a couple weeks later, I said, did you think about it? And they said, yeah, we thought about it. It's an even worse idea than we thought it was the first time. <laughs> so I said, well, let me help you guys. You're not getting the right answer, so I'm not, I'm not asking you anymore. Just build it. Just build the car. And so the first one they built was a red one with saddle interior. And right about that time, Rui called me and said, we're thinking of doing the Indy Pace Car program. Do you have anything that we could use as a pace car? I said, well, yeah, we probably do. We just, we just built this Mustang Cobra convertible. Maybe that would work. He said, fine. So we took it down. Now normally when people take, companies take a pace car program to Indy, they come down with a semi and a big squad of people and a big surrounding cast and they you know, fluff it and stuff and all that. This car, our guy just got in the car and drove to Indy. <laughs> and he showed up 
He talked to the guy that was in charge of the pace car. He said, I'm here with the pace car. The guy said, well, let's go out on the track. And they were halfway through the first lap, and he said, this is fine. No more work is necessary. He did ask that we build three of them with automatic transmissions. He said, you can't control them. And, and if we put manual transmissions in, they'll all be broken before the race. So uh, then we wanted Parnelli Jones to drive it. Whoever was broadcasting the race, it might have been ABC, said, no, we want Bobby Unser. He said, no, we want Parnelli Jones. So they said, OK, you can have Parnelli Jones, but your pace car will not be in any picture on the TV coverage. And if anybody remembers looking at the IndyCar race in 1994, we never got in one shot. They kept their cameras oriented in a way that they never showed the car. But we sold a thousand of them, I think. And I saw two or three of them here, so I know they're still alive and well. And then the last thing I'm going to mention, and then I'll open up the questions, is uh, the, the R models. Uh, I remembered in the 60s we built some racing models. And so I thought it would be fun to take a shot at it. So I asked the guys over at uh, Special. Oh, by that time, I think we, we had formed a confederation that we called SVT. It hadn't become an organization yet. It was just a name that we put on this group of people. And a lot of those guys were racers. And so I said, just turn, turn one of these Cobras into a race car so that you could actually take it racing. And I thought that the chance of that thing ever being approved by this multitude of people, you know, in a big company, there's thousands of people who can say no, but almost nobody who can say yes. Those are going down the line, you know, one guy says no and it's over. Yeah. So I thought, well, the lawyers are going to stop this, or marketing and sales is going to stop it, or the base Mustang team, somebody's going to stop it. Well, nobody stopped it. So we decided we would build them. And then I got nervous about, once again, this problem of having the car stuck on the dealer's showroom. So they wanted to build two or three hundred or something, and I said, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to build a hundred of them. And if they sell, then perhaps it sets the stage for a follow-on. And so they ended up ordering seven extra car sets of parts. And when word got out, we had, uh, well, seven, actually, uh, people who had influence of one sort or another, one of whom was on the board of directors of Ford. And so we built all, all, all 107. But there was no thought in that about... Uh, homologation and regulating it, none of that stuff. It was just me being afraid they wouldn't sell. And uh, they all did sell, but most of them went into collections. They didn't end up in, on the racetrack, which really irritated us. So two years later, we did a second R model. That was the white one. This one, the, the first one was a red one. The second one was a white one. And it put the 5.8 liter engine in it. And we did uh, 250 of those. But we had the prospective purchasers fax in their SCCA license. We wanted to be sure that at least there was a chance that they would be racing. And as it turned out, I think still half of them ended up in collections, but the other half got on the track. And then we did the third R model, which was the highlight as far as I was concerned. It had a, by that time it had a supercharged engine, it had independent rear suspension, and it was the only Mustang I ever drove hard uh, that didn't have a gang of understeer. Yeah. It, you could get that thing in the corner and hustle it through a, cur a turn without the usual, you know, cranking the steering wheel way over and sliding the tires sideways and all that stuff. Um, and I think we did 300 of those, and they were priced pretty high, and they still sold out like hotcakes. So I, I couldn't have been more surprised than I was about that. And then I'll just say, in, in the course of the development of some of these cars, we, uh, at that time, we had Jackie Stewart had a contract and had had a contract with Ford, a personal service contract, but it was sort of a technical advice deal. And we had him in these cars many times, took him out on drives, and we'd hear it in his high-pitched voice and Scottish accent, all the things that were wrong. Very good car evaluator, by the way. And I also had uh, Mario Andretti out two or three times. And He's also a very good, you know, no accident these guys win races. You know, they really know what they're doing. And uh, also, uh, we took Paul Newman with us a few times. 
And while most of you know Newman as an actor, he was actually quite a good racing driver. And I once told him that if he hadn't gotten distracted with all this movie crap, he could have been a really good racing driver. <laughs> to which he just smiled. Uh, those were the points I was going to cover. I reckon that 15 minutes of Q&A dedicated to this might not be a waste of time. So uh, if anybody has a question, I'll be glad to try and answer it. Yes. Oh, just how did the SVT truck come about? Well, there were two. The, the SVT truck. Yeah, the question is, how did the SVT truck come about? Well, there were two of them. Yeah, yeah. The first one, 15 minutes. we did in 93, and actually the truck guys had done that. That was a slab side big F-series truck, and it, it, it wasn't such a great truck, but we did it anyway. But the next one, which is the one all of you are thinking about, I think, the, the lightning truck, that was actually Coletti's idea. And I thought it was a stupid idea. We, we exchanged roles here. <laughs> and, and I said, Clay, we're going to do a supercharged, go like a bet out of hell truck. What's the matter with you? So he, he, he didn't argue with me. But shortly thereafter, he invited me out to Death Valley to uh, Furnace Creek, actually, which is an aptly named city, by the way. And uh, it was about 5 or 5.30 at night. Oh, meanwhile, I had been hammering those guys about not driving too fast on public roads. I said, you know, if you, hit a, if you hit an Econoline van full of nuns or kids, you know, we're in a lot of trouble. So then he said, he got me in this uh, lightning truck. And off we went. And I, I, I was going at least 120 in that thing. And it, that wasn't, it would go faster than that. And it handled well, it had been lowered. They made it out of a 4 by 2 so they could lower it at great tires, and I was sold at that stage. And so we put it in production, and it's been a big success too, as you probably know. And its, it's follow-on is the Raptor, which awesome. I would slightly have preferred another Lightning, but I, Raptor's been a big success too, so yeah, awesome. not, uh, not knocking that, actually. Yes? Could you tell me a little bit about the strategy during that era of building a lot of concept vehicles? You built a 5-liter Ranger, the Boss 429 Mustang, the Super Stallion. Was that part of your strategy to promote SVT without advertising? Well, you're flattering us by calling that a strategy. <laughs> those were, those were one-off. And the one I most remember is the Stallion. Coletti came to me and he had, he was, he was just waving his arms around. This is going to be fantastic, fantastic. And, and uh, he, he said, Here's, here was Coletti's story, which I've never audited and probably never will. He said, we will make more money on the models than we will spend building the car. I, I thought that was baloney, by the way. But, so I said to him, OK, I'll give you $185,000 to build that thing, and don't go a dollar over it. So, three or four months later, he rolled in with the car. He said, well, got it for 185000 which I wouldn't bought it. I mean, I'm sure he was cheating. <laughs> Bootlegging yeah. stuff everywhere. Uh, but it, it, it was a precursor, of course, to the ones that came later. Uh, during the run of SVT, about half the products that we thought we would do, we ended up not doing and some of these ones you mentioned earlier, D8 Ford Ranger and such like, uh, we, we didn't do them all. And Rui and I agreed that we would do a market research that included focus groups. Uh, you probably distrust focus groups, and so do I. In fact, uh, Henry Ford, the original Henry Ford, said back, back in 1903, if he would have asked focus groups what they wanted, they would have told him they wanted a faster horse. Well, you have to be careful with focus groups, but we, we were pretty picky about who the focus groups were. And, uh, and we did cars that the focus groups, the people we selected, agreed they would buy for the amount of money we had to charge. And some of the ones that did make it was I, I pushed Coletti to build a, uh, a lightning expedition, which I thought was beautiful. It was a 4 by 2 lower lightning wheels and tires. And, Blackout, all that stuff. Didn't do that. We had a supercharged uh, escort coupe. Didn't do that. Mm -hmm. Had this Ranger. Didn't do that. 
So we, we wanted every product we did to be a winner. And, and, and we didn't want to get into the business of pushing, because if you start pushing, you start putting uh, incentive money against it, you start discounting. And that is the kiss of death, and you're, you're starting down a death spiral that you're not going to get out of. So we did about half the products that we started. Uh, I was wrong on the light. I was also wrong on the Marauder, by the way. Coletti went in and said, we're going to do this Mercury. What? You're going to do Grandpa's car as a performance minister? <laughs> you must be nuts. But I, you know, I said, oh, okay, go ahead. It's interesting, every Marauder owner that I've ever seen at any car show loves the car. Oh, yeah. He tells me that of the production run of X, only this many of this mob, you know, they go through all that stuff. So I was wrong on that. I guess I was wrong about as much as I was right, or even more often. <laughs> uh, anyway, any other? I'm sure there will be. Yes. So my question is uh, related to the, the future of either SVT or SV related products, particularly in the Mustang, and if we've seen Mustang or Shelby or whatever the, the king of the mountain version is, so specifically, do you think we've hit the horsepower cliff with the latest rendition, or why or why not? If, if you look at the you know, history of the Mustang and where things kind of dropped off from 69 to 70, will we run into the same thing now? Or? Well, uh, a couple of... Uh stipulations. And, uh, I, I've been retired 10 years. The last thing I worked on was the, the Ford GT, you know, the car with the engine in the back. Uh, I do go visit SVT every year, maybe twice a year. Uh, I don't know what the four-year plans are, but if you'd have asked me over the past 20 years, do I think we can keep stepping up the power, I, I, I might have said no. And look at, look at what's happened to Mustangs since we did that first Cobra in 93. I mean, nobody could have guessed that. Now, we do have this problem that Art mentioned, uh, the, the 56 or whatever, this mile per gallon thing. That's going to be a big problem. And uh, my guess is that what we will end up seeing are more of these lower displacement, higher specific output engines, like the direct-injected turbocharged uh, V6s that have replaced V8s and the four cylinders that have replaced V6s. I think we'll see more of those. We'll see lighter weight products, probably lighter, well, obviously lighter, but smaller. Uh, but I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm no better able to forecast that than you are, really. It, it, it's hard to know. I would never have guessed that we would have all of these high performance, I mean, really high performance cars. I, I just didn't think it would be possible with fuel economy requirements and emissions requirements and all the rest of that stuff. And there you are. So I hope so because I like this stuff. <laughs> yes. Uh, Coletti always considered you his air cover with upper management. Could you could you talk a little bit about the development of the Terminator? Was that a difficult program to push through because it offered a lot of things that Mustang enthusiasts had asked for for many many years? Well, I'll give you a little Coletti story first, and what I'm going to tell you, I've told him a hundred times. So there's nothing secret about it. Uh, Coletti, the book on him was, when he finished being the business planning manager on the 94 Mustang, the book on him was, he's impossible to manage. And actually, he is impossible to manage. <laughs> but what I said at the time, I needed somebody to run, to run SVT. And I said, that I have an army of people who are easy to manage and don't have any ideas. We got this guy. I know he's hard to manage, but he has lots of ideas, and some of them are good ideas. Not all, but a lot of them. <laughs> and so uh, I agreed to take him on, and I only, I only asked him one thing. Don't embarrass me. Don't go out and do some zany thing that I'm then going to have to go explain and cover for you and all that stuff. And he agreed that he wouldn't do that, and he never did. Uh, now, he always, he, he's in love with superchargers. And he always was. You know, he's a drag he's a product of drag racing. And you know, even back in the sixties you'd go to the drag strip and look at the, the fuelies or the or the funny cars, they'd all be blown. And and also superchargers provide something that turbochargers don't, and that is a lot of grunt right off idle. 
the turbocharged would have to spin up, and so the things are flat and then they take off. A, a supercharged car, you got it right now. And so Coletti was always looking for a way to do a blown supercharged uh, engine to put in one of these Mustangs, and the, the Terminator turned out to be the first real opportunity to do it, and it plowed a lot of new ground, and it set, it set the stage for a lot of other stuff that followed. Oh, yeah. So uh, I, I, would, I would give that to Coletti. I think that was, that was his idea, and uh, but working for him is no Christmas kiss, but things get done. But was there resistance to the supercharged aspect of the car? I'll, I'll say it more broadly. There, there was resistance to every good product Ford ever did. <laughs> every good product Ford ever did. The Mustang had a hell of an uphill battle. Uh, the Explorer, the, the, the truck that made it made the SUV market, was, was done by Skunk Works, roundly criticized by the finance guys and the, and the mainline truck guys. Then when it was a when it was a success, they had a kind of a selected amnesia, and they thought it was their idea. <laughs> <laughs> so they're up on the stage taking bows, and the guys that really did it, you know, they're not even in the room. And uh, the Taurus was a hell of a battle. I mean, a lot of people were against the Taurus. So all of these things. And, and somebody mentioned earlier that if you're timid, you cannot survive in a big company. You'll get rolled over by all the people who tell you 10,000 reasons why not. And so if you want to do things, you have to go find people who, instead of just laying down on the tracks, they charge the engine. And that's a little like Coletti. He, once he gets his mind on, he's got a head like a block of granite. You can't, you can't change his mind. And I tried. I tried to put the V10, the, 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 this fabulous engine we had, I tried to put that in the, in the Ford GT. It didn't quite fit. There was a little package problem. <laughs> but I also had Coletti to deal with. And uh, he was the big, he was a bigger opposition to that than the, than the package problem was. So. And Neil, if it's okay, we'd like to open the floor up to a, a whole Q and A. You've got to have more questions. We've got Gail Halderman and Art Hyde. Let's all take a seat up here, and uh, we'd love you guys to pepper the entire staff. I didn't. The Thunderbird wasn't going to be around long enough to make it viable. So we were all disappointed that when that went away, we know there's a burgundy one out there. If you were at the Carlisle Ford Nationals, somebody said there was a black one. The guys on the team looked at that car and, and said that we didn't build that car. We, the one prototype was around, I think, I think it was crushed, that we never did. Uh, but it was a great, uh, I know Coletti eventually put a, uh, a blower on it. <laughs> Speaking of me, he put a supercharger on it. And then he stuck a spoiler on the back and we were trying to do it as a NASCAR. Uh, one off, and that didn't work on the marketing side, so it went away. But yeah, the, uh, Neil, it was called the back of Coletti's door, where all he would stick a picture of all the ones we've done that we didn't get approval for. And he re when he retired, all the pictures were off the back of the door. I want those photos. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have two questions for you. How did the SVT Contour become about, and then also for, I have a Mr. Chrome Terminator also, how did the seats get chosen for that with the color shifting seats in it also? Uh, I don't remember the seat. I remember the Contour, and I had one of those, and I didn't mention it because this is not a Contour convention, it's a Mustang convention, <laughs> but I thought the Contour was one of the best products we ever did in SVT. That was a great driving car. It was based on the Mondeo from Europe, which had received a lot of attention and got good marks even from the European press who were quite demanding about right and handling. But I, I don't remember what we did with the seats, except I liked them. I knew that. And uh, I wish we could have done, I wish as a company we'd have done a better job with the uh, Contour because I thought it was a great car and uh, we, we really didn't do a very good job marketing it. And so it kind of came and went. And the Contour at SVT was a fabulous car. And any time I see one of those, I ask the driver, and the driver feels the same way I do. It was a great. We wanted everybody who bought one of those things to be pleasantly surprised when they drove it. Because as good as it looked, as much as it promised, you wanted it to deliver more. And I think, by and large, uh, the SVT brand has done that. And they're Cobra already. He was just quite the guy. 
Any more questions? Neil, could you talk about that transition from, from building SVT Cobras to building Shelby GT500s? How did that uh, transition work? No, Art will be better with that. Well, the, you know, we had the uh, SVT Cobra, and actually SVT Cobra had an interesting history. It started out at the uh, SVT, and then we actually had to transfer it to the mainstream Cobra organization. So for a while, I was actually running the, the Cobra uh, program, and um, we decided that uh, for a lot of reasons we needed to transfer it back. Uh, to uh, to SVT and that's uh, and we use the Terminator to do that to do that. Um, but uh, as we were looking at the uh, 06 uh, uh, Shelby uh, or that program, the Cobra, as we were calling it at the time, um, the um, oh, sorry, Condor, Condor, we were calling it at the time. At the time, and um, there was a, qu a question as to what we should call it, and and I think. Uh, I know John had an opinion, and um, it, the opinion was basically, hey, we're going to get 500 horsepower out of this car. This is a legitimate GT500. Um, and um, after a lot of de debate, uh, in the end, that's what we decided to do. And when we called it GT500, we had to call it Shelby, just to be true. And I think it was the right decision. <laughs>